without you. I'm lost without you. But um, I'm glad that I finally am, am uh, in. So now in this morning's lesson, uh, James is going to talk to us about one of the smallest yet extremely powerful members of our body. A member of our body that can be used to bless and build up others or it can also be used to tear down, ruin, and destroy. It's a member of our body that James says is a unruly evil, a uh, full of deadly poison. So what member of the body am I talking about? The tongue, the things that, that we say. Well, in this lesson, James wants to teach us how to control our tongues. In fact, in this chapter, James wants to address a problem that was occurring in the churches that he was writing to. And uh, way back there in chapter 1, he rebukes some in the church who were not able to bridle their tongue or to control what they were saying. Remember that verse? He says, if any man among you seem to be religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, then that man's religion is vain or empty. Well, here in this third chapter, he even says that if you can't control your tongue and what you say, you're spiritually immature. So in the churches, there were those who were causing all kinds of problems. There were those in the church who whose reputations were, were being lied about and they were being gossiped behind their backs and some were even using profanity. And so it was causing all sorts of divisions. So James, in his usual fashion, doesn't pull any punches at all. He's going to get very blunt here. And uh, in these 12 powerful verses is going to correct the problem by showing how dangerous and really how hurtful our words can be. And uh, we'll also learn some ways to be able to uh, control our tongue. So let's get started. Um, let me go ahead and, and read a few of these verses beginning in verse number one. Are you there? And again, get your outlines out. Uh, this was a very convicting lesson for me, let me tell you. Let me, begin in beginning, let me begin with verse number one. He says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm or rudder, 
whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And I'll just read verse number 6, but we're going to go all the way to verse number 12 in my teaching. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Wow! <laughs> That's pretty strong language, isn't it? He doesn't beat around the bush. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead and look at your outline, uh, beginning with number one. Now, James begins by surprisingly addressing a certain group of people inside the church. In verse 1, he is speaking to believers. He says, My brethren, be not many masters. Now, if you circle that word masters, it just simply means teachers. So he's talking to those inside of the church who want or are aspiring to be teachers of the word. And so look what he says. What warning does James give to those who would want to be teachers in the church? Well, look what he says. He says, my brethren, be not many teachers. And uh, uh, because, he says, you shall receive the greater condemnation or judgment. So what in the world is he saying? Well, at first glance, it looks at those he, as if he is condemning the ministry of teaching, but he's not saying that. He's just giving a warning. That's all he's doing. He's telling those in the church, he says, don't run quickly to the role of teaching. And why is that? Because those who teach the Word of God have the responsibility of speaking God's truth. And if they do not, they're going to fall under stricter judgment. That's what he means when he says this. He's not saying don't teach, but, but rather be careful. You need to stop and think. As I came across this verse, I thought, well, again, why do we need to be so careful? And I came up with two reasons. Look in your outline, number two. And the first one is this. Teachers will fall under stricter judgment because what a teacher says affects, that's the word there, it affects many, many lives. You know what? The truth is, sometimes it's an overwhelming feeling that I have and that I experience before a message that I'll preach on Sunday morning. You know, it's a heavy responsibility to handle God's Word accurately, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. You know, too many lives are at stake just to wing it. And the truth is, I don't wing it. Every message that I preach, I spend... Uh, close to 10, sometimes even more, um, preparing. But when I stand in the pulpit, I'm overwhelmed with the responsibility of interpreting correctly the Word of God. Because, why? I'm going to be judged by God to preach the truth. If my teaching is wrong then I'm going to be under his condemnation. The more opportunity that we have to give out the Word of God, the more opportunity and responsibility that we have to speak the truth. So it's a very serious thing. You know what? The Bible says to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It's hard work. But he goes on and says, but rightly dividing the word of truth. I'll turn on the television or listen to others 
And it's as if they're not even interpreting the scriptures correctly. And so many people listen to the wrong instruction from the Word of God and it affects them. There's so much false doctrine out there. And so it can lead people away from God and the truth. You know, when I preach, I, my goal is to teach the Word of God so that others can understand it. You know, there's a verse of Scripture that I have fallen in love with. It's 1 Corinthians 14.9. Don't turn there, but it's a verse of Scripture that means a lot to me. It says this. It says, unless you utter with your tongue words that are easy to understand, how shall it be known what is spoken? I try to put things on the bottom shelf. In fact, I've told people this, and don't judge me for this, but almost every message I prepare, I, don't, I, I prepare it for the church, but I also prepare it for my 16-year-old boy. And he's the only one that I'll ask at the end of the service. I'll say, did you understand what I said? And if he says yes, then I know that I'm okay. I've heard preachers that I can't make sense of what they say. They use big flowery words. Well, that's not me. And some can do that. And some are very articulate. And, uh, uh, and even some can use articulate words and make it simple, but that's my goal. I put it on the lower shelf so we can get it. Jesus told us to feed the lambs. He didn't tell us to feed the giraffes, right? And uh, so um, I, I want to be simple. And another reason why that teachers are going to be under stricter judgment. Boy, I don't even want to tell you this one. And it just breaks me up inside. If you look at your outline, it's this. Teachers fall under stricter judgment because we're expected to live or model the truth, not just teach it. The real test of a teacher isn't what he says, but what kind of life does he lead? Is he living what he teaches or what he professes to believe. Teachers will stumble, but it's important that the teacher live out the principles that he's giving. And what makes it so uh, convicting for me is that I, I, I desperately fail sometimes at being a model for uh, the principles that I preach, but I really do all that I can to measure up to what God expects. Um, and so, uh, I guess we could say, is the teacher living a hypocritical life? I, I don't want to be known as a hypocrite, teaching one way and living another. You've heard that expression, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Have you heard that one before? But it's important. All right. I could spend a lot of time there, but let's look at number three in your outline. What does James say that we all do, including teachers, with our words. Look what he says in verse 2. For in many things we offend all. That word offend means to stumble or to fall. He is saying that all of us, we stumble in a lot of ways. We fall especially in our words. We can say the wrong things. Let me ask you, and Pete, you can't raise your hand on this one because you're hurt, okay? How many of you have never said anything wrong? Let me give you in the past month to someone else. Would you raise your hand? Pete, you can't raise it. I'm sorry. You got rotocuff problems there. We say the wrong things. We hurt each other by our harsh words. 
As a teacher, like I said, we can teach wrong doctrine. We can lie with our words. We can gossip with our words. With our words, we can hurt and devastate others. Jared did such a wonderful job this a uh, couple weeks ago in mowing. I mean, he did it exactly like I wanted him to. He didn't have to do it over. I would say, hey, Jared, you need... And so he said, Dad, come and see. And I saw one little area that he didn't complete. And the first thing I said was, Jared, what? And his countenance just fell by the harshness of my words. And I, you know, I've asked God to really help me to use my words appropriately and correctly. But he says, we're all guilty of saying the wrong things, of arguing, fighting, backbiting. In your outline, look at verse number two. What does James call a person who is able to control what he says? He says, if any man... Offend not in word. Look at it in verse 2. Or um, <clears throat> doesn't stumble. The same is a what? A perfect man. Now that word perfect doesn't mean perfection. It means spiritually mature. And all he's saying here is if a man has learned how to control his speech and what he says... And he's learned how to tame the tongue. Then that person is spiritually mature. And has spiritual maturity. And exercises control in other parts of his life. He says he's a perfect man. And he's also able, it says, to bridle their whole body. All he's saying here is that he's spiritually mature. And that he is disciplined in his speech, he tends to be more self-controlled in other areas of his life as well. He's able to control, for example, his passions, what he thinks about. He's able to control his emotions. He's self-disciplined. And this is a picture of a spiritually mature man. And so that's what James is saying and so many inside of the church that James is writing to is spiritually immature. So he's challenging them here. Now in these next few verses, James wants to talk to them about how powerful the tongue is. Look what he says in verse number 5. He says, even so the tongue is a little member. Our tongues weigh less than two ounces. But let me tell you, even though it's a small part of our body, it's a powerful part of our body. Wouldn't you agree? It is. It is. And in these next few verses, he's going to talk about just how really powerful the tongue is. In verses 3 through 6, he gives us three illustrations here. As to the power of the tongue. What are they? Well, the first one is in verse 3. You put bits in the horse's mouths. A very small bit in a horse's mouth. A small piece of rope. A piece of leather. Or a strap of metal. You can control the powerful movement of a horse. And horses... Now, I'm not a horseman by any means, but I've ridden a few times. And just with a gentle nudge, you can turn that powerful animal anywhere you want him to. All he's saying is, listen, your tongue, it's small like a bit, but it is powerful. The next illustration he gives is about the rudder on a ship, the helm on a ship. The governor or the ship captain can take these, think of these huge luxury liners they are controlled by just a simple piece of metal or a rudder. A small piece, but yet powerful enough to move an entire uh, floating ship. So the tongue, he's saying, in verses 3 and 4, the ships, though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. 
So the tongue is small yet powerful. But then the third illustration, and this is what you got to see, James uses fire as an illustration to describe the destructiveness and the potential danger of the tongue. He compares the tongue to a fire. Look what he says in verse number 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. That was in verse 6. Look at verse 5. Though the tongue is little, look, he says, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, he's just, he compares the tongue, as I said, to a fire. And, for example, with just a small spark, a small match, a fire can grow and destroy thousands and thousands upon acres out there in California, for example. During the summer, a small spark in the wrong place can destroy hundreds and thousands of acres. All he's saying is the tongue is, can be as devastating and destructive as a fire. I paused here for a minute in number seven. This is powerful imagery here. Number seven in your outline, I thought of some ways the tongue can be used in a destructive way. And I thought of, like a fire destroys, how gossip can destroy people's reputations. Lying can cause so much destruction, profanity, false accusations. This tongue can be used to broadcast tales about others. In Leviticus, the Bible says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. In the Old Testament, God was very adamant about it. He says, You're not to tell tales or gossip about others. He says in Proverbs 26, 20, where no wood is, the fire go out, goes out. So where there is no gossiper or talebearer, the strife stops or ceaseth. Again, a talebearer is one who can slander or carry. Um, and, and you don't know the truth about situations. Some folks just don't know how to keep their mouths shut. It's a very common weakness among the churches. You know, when we have some juicy gossip to share, people pay attention to us. Hey, did you hear about... Hey, did you hear that they're not getting along very well? I don't know how true it is, but we're so eager to spread details of facts that we're not sure just how accurate the information is. You know, gossip is, is destructive. So be careful about even listening to it. I think listening to it is as bad as telling it. And the truth is, and this is a powerful statement, he who gossips to you will gossip about you. Do you believe that? It's true. <laughs> I heard this story. In fact, uh, it was in the newspaper. This was a lot of years ago. Carried a story about a woman in a small town who was known for being a gossip. One day, she was visiting the offices of the Chicago Daily News and she was wearing a white dress. And she leaned up against a wall with a freshly copied uh, printed of page of the front page of the newspaper where it was hanging. It was hot and humid. She leaned up against it and got some of the words on her white dress. Later, while she was walking down the street to meet her husband, she noticed that people were walking behind her were laughing. When she finally reached where her husband was waiting, she asked him if there was anything on her back that shouldn't be there. Well, as he turned around, he saw in large black letters, Daily News. <laughs> and realizing the appropriateness of the words, he said, no, dear, nothing's on your back that doesn't belong there. She was one of those who was spreading Daily News. 
when we lie, we break God's commandment. You should not bear false witness. He hates lying. In the book of Proverbs, he says, Six things does the Lord hate. A proud look, a lying tongue. Don't speak evil of one another, the Bible says. And it's hard for me to understand how anyone whose heart is right with God can use foul or lewd language, profanity. The Bible says we're not to tell filthiness or foolish jokes. We should be careful of the words we use. I was at Subway the other day and a group of teenagers had just gotten, you know, last day of school and they were all there. There's probably 15 of them. And I heard the most profane profanity from them. It was so horrid. It was so sad. We criticize others. We call each other incompetent or stupid. <laughs> the other day I was driving. I was praising God on the radio and a guy cut me off and Jared was sitting right next to me and the same breath because it says here we give blessings to God and cursing to others I didn't curse I said what an idiot and Jared looked at me and a few days later he was driving and he said that person's an idiot and I said Jared you're not supposed to say that and he said dad you say it all the time <sighs> I'm just asking God to just take my tongue and help me to control it. The guy was an idiot, though. <laughs> Let me, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it. In harsh words here, he's just trying to show them the destructiveness of the tongue. He says in verse 6, it's a world of iniquity. Or it, the, the tongue is... It produces all kinds of wickedness. You've heard the expression, his house is full of junk, and, or the barn is slammed full of, of, uh, of equipment. Well, he's just saying the tongue can produce all kinds of iniquity and sin. He says it defiles the entire body. Look what it says in verse 6. It defiles the whole body. He's talking about the heart. Because the words that come out come from our heart, according to Jesus. It comes from that nature, and it defiles us. It's because of that. It's not a pretty picture here. And then he says something very powerful. Look what he says. And it is set on fire of hell. What does that mean? Well, that word hell is the word Gehenna in there. And he's referring, and his readers would know what he was talking about. It was called the Valley of Hanan. And it was really the garbage dump where they took everything and then they would burn it. And so he says, this is what the tongue causes. It's full of destruction, putrid smell, like set on fire from like the garbage pit of Gehenna or the Valley of Hymnon. My, oh my, I've got to hurry. And I just want to say this. Look at verse number 8. In verse, look at, look, look at verses 7 and 8. And I'll close here. In verses 7 and 8, what does James mean when he says we can, we can tame all kinds of animals but the tongue can no man tame. Look what he says. He says, Every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. It was really sad the other, uh, a couple weeks ago, the Ringling Brothers Circus is no longer going to continue because of animal rights. They say they abuse the animals, but they tamed animals, didn't they? I remember as a child going and watching the big elephants, and we can tame them, but he says no man can tame the tongue. Do we just give up? What is he saying here? He is saying this. He is saying, if you try to control your tongue in your own willpower, you won't be able to do it. It's an unruly evil, untamable. But listen, if you will yield to the Holy Spirit of God and ask Him 
to control your tongue, he will give you the supernatural power and grace to be able to control it. I've never really asked God to control my tongue. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him to take control of parts of my body, my hands, my feet, my eyes. But I'm going to challenge you this week to show you how untamable your tongue is. I'm going to ask you to experiment. I want you to go ahead and try to tame it on your own. Just with your willpower. Make a decision right now and say, I'm going to say the right things in every instance. I'm not going to get mad at my dog. I called my dog an idiot the other day. It's a three-pound dog, and poor little thing was just trembling when I yelled at it. But you got, you got to know what it caused. It caused me a whole... I, I was over at the house. I put these new closets in, and he got under my feet, and I started to fall, and I was getting ready to land on him. I mean, three pounds and a hundred and... I won't tell you how much I weigh, but to land on him... The electrician was right there. He tried to save me. He jumped down to get me, and he fell on top of me, and I busted the whole door, and I got so mad at that dog because he caused the whole thing. Anyway, I want you to try this week on your own to control what things you say. Watch how many times you criticize others. Watch how many times you use abusive language. Watch how many times you get angry. You'll soon realize by Tuesday that you can't do it. And so I'm going to ask you to talk with God and ask Him to set a watch before your mouth. And I'll just say this, and we're done. I'm going to give you three verses that I didn't even... I'm not going to finish with what I'm saying. But write these verses down. If you're really serious about asking God to control your tongue. Psalms 19.13 Keep back thy servant um, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. This verse, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Again, that was Psalms 13 and 14. And the last one, Psalms 141.3 Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. This little red thing in your mouth is a little rebel that's guarded by white soldiers. It's unruly. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll close. Father, forgive us for how we use this 